before we get into today's video, I want to say thank you to HelloFresh, who are my sponsor for this video, even though we actually use HelloFresh, which means that I feel like I'm being super treated. I love HelloFresh for a billion reasons, but one of the main ones is I always struggle with figuring out variety. I'm one of those people that's old school, so I like know how to cook five dishes and stick to those. So I started with HelloFresh because I wanted to improve the amount of dishes that I could deliver to my family. And that's why I decided to go with them because that's exactly what they do. Apart from the fact that you don't end up with any waste because everything comes, the right amount arrives, that means that you're never going to be in a situation where you're just wasting money. Not saying I used to waste money. I did used to waste money. I used to waste so much money. I used to clear my fridge and be like, why have I done that? Not anymore. In fact, if you looked in my fridges, they're pretty empty apart from this stuff. The great thing about HelloFresh is that you can order for a family of four. And that means that you're constantly changing and switching up the kind of food that you're eating. But of course, this would not be one of my videos unless I cooked the meal. They come in this packaging, so it's all there for you. You get your meals, you get your recipes that you can cook. And of course, what you end up with is something really delicious. And I'm gonna show you. Didn't know I was a chef, did you? I'm not a chef. I'm not a chef, but I am a chef when it comes down to HelloFresh. So stick with me, guys. I'm going to speed it up so you don't have to wait 20 minutes. For this next part, I require my glamorous assistant. <laughs> Here we have it, the true taste test. The great thing about this, whilst he tucks in, if you've never tried HelloFresh before and it's one of those things you're not sure about, I can heartily recommend it, but even better, they're going to give you 50% off your first box. That is such a saving. It will introduce you to these new opportunities of cooking. And really, I promise you, there is something for everyone, no matter how old you are, you are going to find recipes that are delicious. After getting that first reduction, you're going to get 35% off your next three boxes, which I cannot impart to you enough. Look at this delicious food. Would you ever have conceived making that? Probably not. So if you want to try new foods, give yourself a taste sensation of opportunity, honestly, HelloFresh is great. So I'm going to stop him finishing the entire thing because there are other members of my family who will be very angry if he keeps shoveling it into his mouth. Does it taste fantastic? Absolutely delicious. <laughs> HelloFresh is awesome. Thanks for sponsoring the video. Get you 50% off by following the link Emma Kenny and you will be able to enjoy these meals too. and bruised and very tight-faced Emma Kenny after having really serious nose surgery. So if you're new to this channel and you're thinking, what is this weird looking woman going on about? I'm explaining my face. This is the result of a really, really, really hardcore nasal operation. But anyway, at least I am at a point where I'm able to string a sentence together and carry on with my crime content. I said to you when I began this channel, I was gonna be consistent. I have a crime and consistency channel. Wednesdays and Sundays, religiously, I release my content, even if I look like I've been in a really serious boxing match and lost, probably around the fifth round. I gave it a good go, but I got battered. That's kind of what's going on. You'll notice I can't really move my face the same on this side because this is what took most of the brunt of the surgery. So just please be accepting of my face. That's all I can say. 
Today, I'm gonna to be talking about a crime that you've asked me for. It is a crime I have covered three times on different documentaries, so it's important to me that I really deep dive into this particular crime, make sure that I explore it in a way that I haven't had the chance to do so in my TV shows, and hopefully tell you a little bit more about the crime than you may know already. I'm aware that a lot of you want me to do this because you have seen it covered elsewhere, so I hope I do it justice. Before I get into it, massive shout out to my Patreon subs. Thank you so much, guys. Obviously, I'm trying to get more and more content on there, but just the fact that you stay with me even when I'm going through my struggles and you support me, it's incredible. It's amazing. It means I can bring you the content that I bring you. The same to my people who have joined membership on YouTube. Genuinely, every time I see your little green names light up on my live chats, I am so thrilled. Thank you. Today's case is one that, like I've said, I've covered before. But the detail I've gone to today has even opened my eyes to it further and alerted me to some of the facts that I didn't know. I'm going to be covering the Gemma Hater murder. It's one you've asked for. It's one that many of you have asked for. And I feel that the reason for that is one of the things that we all connect with when we talk about these stories is vulnerability and people's vulnerabilities being preyed on. And I think it does something profound to us emotionally. It's almost impossible to imagine when somebody already has a series of struggles. They've faced challenges in life that already feel unfair, and then they are attacked in the way that I'm gonna to discuss today in spite of already having these additional burdens. It just provokes something within us. And certainly for me, I align myself with those feelings and I think that's why so many of you want me to do this case because no matter how many times you hear about this murder, it is striking, shocking and staggering that we ever have to talk about this because this should never have happened. What kind of human beings are preying on people with these huge vulnerabilities? It's a real blight and mark on our society as far as I'm concerned. Gemma Hater was somebody who struggled. She struggled throughout her life. And going back in time, her mother Sue, well, she was fully aware that her youngest daughter just wasn't like her two other children. Mothers have that connection, they have that instinct. If you already have children and then you give birth to another child and they aren't fulfilling their developmental goals that you would expect them to do, or they're acting in a way that is not typical of what your experience has been, you notice it, and Sue does. But also there is a physical component to that. There was something unusual when she was a young child that became more pronounced with respect as she got older. Now those who had contact with her during her life described her very early on as looking different, so her physical appearance stood out. And she did have a very small stature and there were some very distinctive facial features. I would, to some degree, align it with a similar appearance and a similar connection to a congenital condition such as Down syndrome, so the physical features when you actually looked at her. However, they tested for congenital disorders and they came back negative. Sue, her mother, was also aware that as a side to just looking different from other children, Gemma wasn't like other children in other ways as well. So she very much struggled to do the things that other children did. So essentially, from very early on, Sue was able to note that Gemma had some kind of delayed development issue. However, the agencies that could have provided help and support for Gemma just continually failed to do so. This is despite Sue's constant attempts. So Sue is rigorously trying to get the services to recognise that her daughter is atypical and requires some extra support, some additional support, investigation, help and so on and so forth, but it doesn't come to fruition. Now, because of that, in spite of the attempts, Gemma would not formally 
be diagnosed with a specific medical condition. Now that's an issue. Any of us as parents, look, we all want our children to just be born, thrive, succeed in everything they do, and live happy, healthy lives as adults. Ad infinitum. That's how we feel, right? When we've got a kid who isn't lucky enough to fit into that typical, stereotypical, at least, mould of what we would all wish for, we want to know what is going on, and also, most importantly, what are the solutions? What are the things that we can do for our child, give to our child, create for our child so that their life has a level of ease in spite of the difficulties? If you don't get things like a medical diagnosis or a mental classification or a developmental explanation for these issues, understandably, there are going to be more obstacles and barriers in the way of that individual accessing things that are appropriate for them. So not only do they fail at this point, this service failure from my research means that from this point onwards, it impacted throughout her life. Simple as, because they hadn't actually been able to formulate a reality of what this young girl was experiencing and diagnose it. Then throughout the rest of her life, no one really knew what they were dealing with, right? So it makes it more difficult for Gemma. And without a doubt, I'll say this right at the get-go of this conversation with you, this would definitely be a contributory factor in her death. So those very early issues are one of the reasons why she isn't alive today. Now, Gemma grew up with her two half-siblings, her mother and her stepfather. Gemma's biological dad had actually left the family when she was just nine years of age. And we can understand that creates some kind of dysfunction in the family home, in the family structure. It can be challenging for children emotionally when parents split up. And certainly if you also have additional needs that can feel volumized and amplified. As I've said, as a child, Sue, her mother, regularly expressed concern about Gemma in general, but also the behavior that she was involved in at home. Now, even though the behavior at home was problematic, school apparently didn't initially witness this. It seems like for whatever reason, Gemma didn't stand out in that way, at least initially at school. But as she starts to get older, the teachers start to become aware that there was an issue. I have looked at Gemma, I've looked at pictures of Gemma, descriptions of Gemma, I've looked at her mother's explanations about Gemma. I cannot believe that from the very first day at primary school, or prior to that, if she was in nursery, people weren't picking up on it. You don't need to be a qualified medic, psychologist, therapist, child expert, occupational therapist, speech therapist, to just be able to look at that child and the way that their gait is, the way that their facial features are, and the way that they're interacting with the world around them to be able to pull an absolute obvious connection with the fact that there are some deeper issues that need to be explored for this child so that they can gain and garner the appropriate support that is required. So we understand that when somebody's at primary school, the developmental delay that they are experiencing is maybe not as obvious early on as it will be by the time of nine, 10 years of age, certainly at secondary school. And it seems that even though, as I said, I'm surprised it wasn't really noted, as she gets a little bit older, the teachers do become aware that there's an issue. And at this point, they diagnose her as having a learning disability. Now, the assessment that they did it involved an IQ assessment, and they found that she had an IQ of between 62 and 65. Now, this they classed as a mild learning disability, although subsequent assessments would class a disability as moderate to severe. Have to say, IQ of 62 to 65 is very low. You think about the average IQ being 100. So I would argue that mild is probably not the appropriate label to use at this moment in time. Again, is this the beginning of us seeing systemic failures in the way that Gemma was treated in institutions throughout her life? So subsequent assessments understandably found her disability as moderate to severe. 
like I've said, I'm really surprised that with the self-reported issues that mum's saying about home, the developmental delay that's becoming clear, the IQ that's very, very low, that would ever have been noted as moderate. But obviously, I had nothing to do with that. So I can't state claim to knowing why it occurred. Just anecdotally, experientially, and commonsensically saying there were some severe issues here. One of the big problems that it seems occurred in Gemma's care was there was never any real consensus amongst experts. And that is a problem because when you look at a multidisciplinary approach, so let's look at these social services, psychological services, school services and educators, speech therapists and so on and so forth, all coming together to explore the kind of support a child needs. What you want is for agreements, you know, you want the GP, the specialist child expert and so on and so forth to all kind of mirror what they believe is going on for that child so that they can agree a particular kind of learning opportunity for them, you know, a program that's going to work for them with special educational needs acknowledged. But this pattern of people just not agreeing with one another and her not getting the appropriate care just seems to be a massive pattern in Gemma's future assessments throughout her life. Now, ultimately, Gemma did receive some educational support during primary school. So they did note that she needed some help and they did attend to that. But she struggled. She really did. She was in a mainstream educational setting and essentially she was very different from the other kids. And it was something that was very difficult for her. And a lot of people believe that it's really important to integrate people with needs into mainstream providers because the world is kind of a mainstream place, right? So the more that you can get children who have additional needs to feel that they fit in in that environment, the easier it may be for them to form alliances, fit into the world and so on and so forth. But actually I've seen quite the contrary in lots of cases where children have gone to a primary school or a secondary school who have quite serious needs and even though they can function, what happens is they get horribly bullied, they get isolated, they feel completely alone and it additionalizes some of the problems that they're experiencing. Everybody has their own point of view on that. Some will agree with me, some will disagree with me. I'm sure for some people with needs, it will be amazing going to a secondary school or a primary school with children who don't have their needs, but they feel loved, cared for, and they fit in brilliantly. It's horses for courses. What works for one won't work for another. After she finishes primary school, they decide, understandably, that she does need to have some continuing support within her education. And at this point, she's placed in a special education needs school for her secondary education. So clearly, the coping that she is experiencing in primary school is notably falling. She's not able to do well enough and thrive well enough in that environment. So moving out to a mainstream provider in secondary would have potentially caused further issues for her allowing her to be in a place where her needs are at least catered for to some degree, I feel was a good idea because she would have smaller class sizes. There would be lots of different types of teaching. There's usually sensory rooms and it's a space where she wouldn't feel too distinct from other individuals. And that's important too. Children need to feel that there are reflections of themselves in the world. And this particular place would, I feel, be the appropriate place to meet those needs. Now, after she's attended the secondary education, the special education within that, and then Gemma actually spent her final years of education again at a residential college in Wales. And that placement had been arranged by her parents. So it really feels like, even though it's extreme, removing a child from home, and placing them in an educational establishment away from home. And some people will dispute that being positive because clearly it can be disconcerting and emotionally challenging for a child to be put away from home, particularly if they have complex needs. You also need to think about the fact that Gemma was potentially challenging to handle at home without the appropriate supervision and people are trying to live their lives and bring up other children and it cannot be the most appropriate placement 
for a child to be in the home setting full time. So her mum and stepdad clearly are looking to have her needs met elsewhere, whilst also protecting and looking after their own home environment. So it would have made sense to some degree to do that. Clearly at this point, Gemma has been experiencing a level of support, right? She's gone through her education. It's been acknowledged that whilst I'm not quite sure what's going on with her, that she needs these additions to make her safe, to give her the opportunities that she deserves. But unfortunately, even though these had occurred in her childhood, the support that she received from the agencies simply doesn't continue into her adult life. And if that isn't difficult enough to suddenly find yourself without the kind of support that you require as a family member or as an individual, as Gemma grew older, well, her issues became more and more pronounced. So she gets more and more problematic and she's dealing with bigger challenges and ultimately social services got involved so social services became involved with Gemma during her adolescence because clearly she has these vulnerabilities when she was 18 she does get a diagnosis so she's diagnosed at that age as being on the autistic spectrum however as with her learning disability, there were differing opinions about this too. So when they tested her again as an adult, well, they decided that she had neither a learning disability nor was she autistic. I cannot compute who made those decisions genuinely. This is a serious issue and, you know, I appreciate that sarcasm is one of those things that has to be used in choice areas, but seriously, did they get the work experience kid from the secondary school in to do the assessment? Were they like, hey, you want to you wanna get involved with seeing how we work in social services and psychological systems? Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm 16. Honestly, we've got some work in assessments. You'll love it. It'll be great for your CV. Are you sure? I've like, I literally just work at a deli on a Saturday and I've only taken this placement because there was no other free placements on the work experience scheme. It'll be fine. This is Gemma. You know, what? What were they thinking? Saying that there was nothing wrong with her. So instead, oh, they diagnosed Gemma with a conduct disorder at 25. Now this I do not understand. I do not understand at all why they decided to classify her with a conduct disorder. I just cannot make sense of it. I have looked at this case both on TV, I've looked at it in my research this time, I've read a great deal about it, and yet I am still profoundly blindsided by the idea that she was given a classification being diagnosed with conduct disorder because conduct disorder is basically a behavioral disorder and it tends to mean that the individual is antisocial sometimes highly antisocial and that they don't know how to behave simple as that they haven't got a pro-social reality to them they disregard social norms that would be a way of describing it I mean, I cannot compute how they would have just thrown to the side developmental delay issues, learning disabilities, obviously the emotional component of dealing with all of that, the clear issues that have been supported through school, the IQ test, all of these things that together show you that she had complex needs and instead they bring it down to her having an issue with her behavior. Anyway, this is a recognized mental disorder, conduct disorder, by the way. Now, this, even in the short span of 25 years, demonstrates how inconsistent the understanding of Gemma Hater was, the inconsistency in the diagnoses, the classifications, the reactions by services, and this continual lack of having 
a definitive diagnosis. This all meant that Gemma would basically be provided with, this basically meant that Gemma would never be provided with any effective support in her day-to-day -day living, which is unbelievable. So whilst there are lots of doubts about Gemma's medical condition and everyone's got a different opinion on this, there is one thing that is absolutely certain. She was highly vulnerable. Gemma Hater was incredibly naive and incredibly trusting. Again, another reason why I really don't understand why conduct disorder was even thrown into the hat of possibilities. And yeah, I'm not a diagnoser and I'm not a psychiatrist and I'm not a clinical psychologist. I appreciate that, but I don't need to be. I've worked with many people who've had classifications, including those with conduct disorders. And I'm telling you now, Gemma Hater does not have a conduct disorder, full stop. Now, because of this vulnerability, because of this naivety and trusting behavior, it was identified that she was at risk of abuse or exploitation. So the statistics and research show that adults who suffer abuse tend to be able to do something about it, even though I'm not saying that people do do things about it, but they do seem to have the wherewithal to be able to challenge it to some degree, either through themselves or through seeking help from someone else. It doesn't mean that victims go ahead and do that. We know that people end up in awful situations because in spite of them having their faculties, they just don't feel that they can ask for the help or they're too scared to ask for it. But the rule of thumb is that people who are at least cogent in their thinking and have a typical capacity mentally are at least aware that there are certain opportunities if they are struggling to seek some kind of support. But with Gemma, it was clear that she didn't understand that world. In fact, people who knew her and even services who were involved with her recognize that Gemma would never tell on anybody, no matter what they did to her. So as far as Gemma was concerned, if you were somebody who told her that you were her friend, then you could do whatever you wanted to do with her. It's as simple as that. That's how desperate she was for connection without the sophistication psychologically of understanding what good friendship is about. Because we need that. A lot of you listening who might have had attachment and abandonment issues when you were children, or maybe you've experienced traumatization, the chances are that at times you may have put up with relationships that were less than good enough, not because you have failed in any way, but because you have been taught to expect less in your relationships. But usually in spite of that, because you have the wherewithal mentally, over time you start to disregard that level of vulnerability to assert yourself to a better position because you realize you were not to blame and you deserve more. It's not always. Some people live that for the whole lifetime, but for the most part, people will start to do that because you can consciously understand, well, hang on, this person needs to treat me like A, B or C to get C, D, E back. That's how we should experience relationships with reciprocity. If we're not getting that, we're meant to call those relationships, aren't we? If they're not good for us, like I said, some of us need to do that work throughout our lives, but nonetheless, that's common. Gemma hasn't got that. Gemma hasn't the sophistication. She certainly hasn't the discretion and she can't diligently execute the reality is of which relationships need to stay, which relationships need to go, which ones are good for her, which ones are bad for her, which makes her ultimately vulnerable. Because if you say I like you, that's it she devotes her loyalty to you. Now, someone who actually knew Gemma would later describe her in this way. They said that she was a lovely girl, totally innocent and childlike. So literally the opposite of what conduct disorder is. Seriously, that is going to grate on me for good. I want to find the person who carried out that so I can have a challenging conversation with them about how they could have ever suggested this young girl, this vulnerable child who had grown into a vulnerable adult could ever have essentially been told there was something dysfunctional in her character behavior wise, when clearly she has complex developmental needs. Anyway, I'm a bit, bit, bit angry there, a bit angry there, not gonna lie. 
little bit on the rageful side. I'm going to calm myself down a little bit. Calm myself down. I'm probably just reflecting what you're feeling right now, by the way. But I'm just going to calm myself down a little bit. Anyway, despite the fact that she's got this intense vulnerability, Gemma genuinely wasn't given the protection that she needed from service providers. Now, this was in part down to Gemma's conduct, and I'll tell you why. Gemma, in spite of having these needs, wanted to be independent. She didn't want to be treated like a child. We appreciate that. This is a girl who has had support throughout her life, but bear in mind, she has been in a residential school. So if you've been in a residential school for quite a long period of time, then gone to a college that's residential, and then people expect you to just move home to your parents, you haven't been living in that situation or state for a period of time. You mentally may have shifted to a belief system that you no longer need to live in the fold of your family. And as well, she's been living independently, albeit in residential placements, and she probably feels like she's an adult now. She's over 25 years of age. So essentially, she likes to assert that she wants to be treated like an adult. And she was sometimes resistant to the support that was offered. She was. Because how can Gemma let you know how she's feeling if she hasn't got the emotional cogency and capacity to express herself as you or I would, because we're blessed with the capacity to do so, she's gonna have less behaviors that can demonstrate a resistance. And when people have less behaviors, let's take back to child state. Anybody who's a mother or a sibling or has friends with kids and so on and so forth, we've all watched a child when they're not getting their own way. They might go and stamp off, stand in the corner. They might throw a toy. They might bite you. They may hit you. They may lie on the floor and scream. And I'm not talking about just toddlers. We see this behavior in seven, eight, nine-year-olds at times. So arguably with Gemma, her IQ, her learning developmental delay, we've got to take her back to considered child state to some degree. And her reactions will therefore be similar. But when you're quite a big young woman and you're an adult now, at the end of the day, when you act aggressively with the services and when you fail to engage with the services, you will create a bias. They will believe, well, this person doesn't necessarily want the help. They're being objectionable. Maybe they're a little bit scary and you will believe the worst in them instead of saying to themselves you have an emotionally stunted young woman because of her developmental issues but I've got to say in spite of these moments the refusal to cooperate seemed the exception rather than the norm so yes there were moments where she was like no I don't want to do that or I don't want to engage but that was rare most of the time Gemma was happy to have the help so referrals were made to adult social care services and they actually made a plan for her for after when she finished college because clearly these things were put in place before she finished her residential placement and it did identify in that plan that she'd need help with things like managing risks, looking at her diet, her nourishment, they wanted people to check on her social support networks. Obviously, she needed help with housing, money management, shopping. They noted that she needed help with hygiene and home cleanliness. But if I'm honest, the transition that you would expect for somebody with such issues from child to adult care services, it just didn't happen. If there was a net to fall through then the gaping hole that seemed to be apparent where Gemma was concerned is absolutely a reality. She did not get the support that she either deserved, wanted, or should have received in spite of whether she did or otherwise because she was incredibly, incredibly vulnerable. So after she finishes college in Wales, Gemma actually returned to rugby in July 2004. She returned there at the age of 21. And when she moves back to rugby, she actually moves in to a housing project with the Mayday Trust. Now, that's an organisation that helps people and it tends to help people who are going through some really, you know, tough, 
life transitions. So people who are experiencing homelessness, leaving care, people who are coming out of prison even. But one of the things that that means is there's a huge mix of individuals with quite serious and debilitating social, emotional, environmental, physical issues altogether. So I think that would be relatively chaotic. And what you want ideally for a placement for someone like Gemma is a place that understands her individual needs. So it isn't just lumping in her in with people who might struggle, but still have less developmental and physical issues than she's experiencing. And when she's placed there, she actually has a tendency terminated. That's in 2006, in the September. And the reason for this is because of her social communication issues and her wish for independence. Again, I'm not surprised that she would be asking to be independent if she'd been placed somewhere as chaotic as this that felt so different to her prior experiences. Her tendency as well to be exploited was another reason that there were tenancy issues. So this isn't blaming the staff at all. Obviously, they're trying to do their best for this big range of people with a big range of concerns. But they note that when she's there, people immediately can see that there are vulnerabilities that can be turned towards their advantage. So if you have a predatory nature, Gemma Hayter stands out immediately as somebody that you can exploit. So on one occasion, she's allegedly asked to look after drugs by the landlord of a local pub. Now, those drugs included heroin, they included crack cocaine, and because of that, she subsequently gets charged with possession. I mean, again, it takes two minutes to look at Gemma, and don't get me wrong, I appreciate guys, people can be like, oh, you know, don't judge by appearances, Emma. Not everyone is blessed with looking like somebody fully typical and stereotypical in our society. I get it, I get it. No, with Gemma Hater, one look at her, even the way that she moves, the way that she speaks, that's enough to note that there is something very challenging going on for her on a daily basis regarding understanding the world around her. It's okay for us to notice those differences. It's okay, that's how we meet needs of people. That's how we protect people. If we're gonna walk around pretending that you can't sometimes tell that somebody needs help and needs lots more support than the average human, we're not gonna acknowledge and make changes so that that person has a better life. Simple as that. The fact that she has just yeah, I accepted the fact that she'll look after these drugs. She'll have no idea what she's doing there. But she gets charged with possession? On whose watch? And what were they thinking doing that? Now, I'll tell you, this is actually a growing issue. It's known as cuckooing. So you'll know where the word cuckooing comes from. Cuckoos, the birds. I quite like cuckoos. It's on the side. I digress a little bit. I digress. I like nature. And cuckoos are quite beautiful in their own way, but they are also little tossers, aren't they? Because they're like, I'm just gonna lay an egg in another bird's nest. And then they're just gonna fly off and get on with their world. So a lot of people like that in the world, aren't they? Just like impregnate and leave. But in the cuckoo world, that's what happens. The cuckoo will lay an egg in a nest of another bird's and then that egg will hatch usually in a small bird's nest and that bird will feed the cuckoo, usually at a disadvantage to the other eggs. That's if the cuckoo has not already been born as a baby and then just like eaten the eggs as well. So it's called cuckooing. So this is where criminal gangs exploit vulnerable people. So clearly she's the perfect target, isn't she? And that would have been really concerning to all of the staff in that particular place. They want to make sure that their residents aren't put in these situations. Oh, at this point, I'm instantly saying, clearly this young girl needs additional support. 
whether she wants independence or otherwise, it's not gonna be right for her. We've evidenced that left to her own devices, even in a place where she's gonna get some support, she is making choices that are quite challenging, stroke devastating, stroke dangerous for her life. But nonetheless, they decide that Gemma was ineligible for adult social care services. Apparently because of her lack of engagement and lack of learning disability diagnosis, they were like, that's not our problem. Again, I draw you back to my last conclusion. On that day, were they like, how long have you been in the job? I'm not even in the job. I've just walked in off the street. I was just having a look around the offices. Can you do me a favor? I don't, I'm just a member of the public who walked in off the street. I don't even know who you are or what this is. Yeah, 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 just come into my office, read that. I don't have any idea what this is. Do you think she needs help? I don't know. No, no, that's right, no. That's how it would have gone. And if it didn't go like that, what kind of excuse can be made for failing this young woman at this point? Lack of engagement, that's not unusual for people who have a set of complex needs. And the fact that there is a lack of learning disability diagnosis, that's the failure of the services, not of Gemma. So she gets evicted from Mayday tenancy. At this point, she ends up living in privately rented shared accommodation. But again, she at this point is highly vulnerable and she's completely at risk of exploitation. The police, honestly, they were often round at her address. In fact, it was around four times a month that the police were round at that address. And the reason for that, she was frequently, and I mean frequently, the victim of crime. She was the victim of theft, extortion, and these are big issues that should be drawing the spotlight back onto Gemma because this clearly denotes the potential for harm. If somebody is being exploited this way constantly, it is an escalation often where a victim gets tested out more and more and more until they're exploited to a degree which is highly damaging to their life. Or in this case, as far as I'm concerned, causes the end of their life. In 2004, police investigated her capacity to consent to sexual intercourse. This is following an alleged rape. And can you believe this? There's been this alleged rape. We all know after what I've talked about today that Gemma Hayter developmentally, emotionally, psychologically, socially, physically, was not in a comparable space to you or I. And yet, after an alleged rape has occurred, the police want to investigate whether she's got the capacity to say yes. The police were advised she didn't have a learning disability. Again, did the police have eyes? Could the police have a conversation? Were the officers able to just look at her, have a brief conversation with her, and maybe go, oh, well, even though there isn't a learning disability, actual report demonstrating what she has. You know, we can just see with our own eyes and hear with our own ears, but no. When did sense prevail in these situations? So they're told that she hasn't got a learning disability and that meant that no formal assessment of her capacity to consent to sexual intercourse was carried out. They didn't even bother. What the hell am I having to tell you today? I mean, how insanely disrespectful is that? How uncannily unfair is that? This is a highly vulnerable woman. She's being exploited and they're more concerned about whether she could say yes, as opposed to the fact that there's alleged rape. February 2008, police do actually make a safeguarding referral to adult social care. And what happens with that? Nothing. Just absolutely no further action 
taken by adult social care at all. So at this point, the police were in fact advised to contact mental health services. Now, I will tell you that Gemma did actually have multiple referrals to mental health services, but the assessment took such a long time because she didn't attend very often. There was a sporadic attendance in her nature. And in spite of the fact that there was this sporadic nature and the assessments therefore formally couldn't really be done in the way that they should have been done, they concluded that she did not have a learning disability or autism. Okay, whatever. So the fact that she doesn't engage as you would like means that you're just going to go, oh, well, she definitely doesn't fit the criteria. Well, let me tell you, the criteria has nothing about attendance as part of it for a start, so that shouldn't even count. But again, this resistance to engage does not denote that somebody does not require support. The whole premise of the way that we live in the Western world, in particular, is at times we recognize that some people aren't in the ability and capacity to make decisions over their own lives, so that legally we remove that. We give things like power of attorney, where other people make decisions over another person's life. This is what happens when we realise that they may not wish to engage, but that they should engage, but not for Gemma Hater. So even though they say that there's no learning disability or autism, but what should have occurred, in spite of the fact that they had concluded that she didn't have a learning disability or autism, what should still have taken place is a vulnerable adult meeting. That would have established a help plan for Gemma. And this, would have included the creation of a more structured living environment. That would have been one of the key issues that they would have wanted to explore to ensure that she was in a safe and appropriate place. Sadly though, as is so often the case in the stories that I tell you about these tragic events, that meeting never took place. No, never happened. Should have, like so many other things that should have taken place in Gemma Hater's life, but it just didn't. Now, between 2006 and December 2008, Gemma had 64 contacts with mental health services. 64. And when they looked back, when they inquired about how the horrors that unfolded, unfolded, they established that there'd actually been a tendency to just close her files too early on without proper investigation. You see, I have a real problem with that because Gemma haters represent the most vulnerable in our societies and yet often because they have those vulnerabilities as opposed to them getting more care, it's almost as if services find it easier to just close down the cases because these vulnerable people don't necessarily know how to ask or demand for the appropriate type of care, thus rendering them even more vulnerable than they already are. So Gemma is ultimately evicted as well from her private tenancy. And in August 2008, she's identified as homeless. And at this point, she's provided with housing via Rugby Borough Council. And she receives support from Orbit, which is a voluntary organisation. And what Orbit did was provided more minimal support, if I'm honest, all about just helping her to maintain her council tenancy. So there was some support, but it wasn't a lot of support, it certainly wasn't enough support, but there was a little bit of support there. Now, Gemma had an absolute love of animals. I mean it, she loved them. Again, what does that tell you about her as a personality? She's looking for connection and animals will love you unconditionally. They will spend time with you. They will be your best friends. They require very little of you as long as you share space with them and feed them. And Gemma loved that. She talked to every dog or cat that came away. She shared her flat with a hamster and a cockatiel called Jasmine. But one thing I would say to you is Gemma should not have been living independently. Her living conditions were absolutely abysmal. Genuinely, they were abysmal. So even though she got a little bit of support, Gemma continued to struggle with her tenancy. And 
The council and Orbit themselves, they were very concerned about this chaotic lifestyle that she led, but also her vulnerability. So again, that's cropping up. Everybody who's had work with her has recognised through this high level of vulnerability about Gemma. She was really struggling to get her finances in order, constantly getting into debt. And she was also starting to show signs of self-neglect. So she had real personal hygiene issues. She would be very challenged to keep track of time. So she'd be late for things and she didn't necessarily know where she should be at what time. Also, she didn't have anyone to tell her when to have a bath, when to go to bed. So that meant that she just ultimately lived how she wanted in a time frame that she wanted and didn't necessarily think about the self-care issues. I mean, her flat was a real mess. It was untidy, to say the least. I mean, it was full of rubbish. It was a little bit like a hoarder's place. It smelt disgusting. In fact, Gemma's flat smelt so terrible that it actually engulfed the entire floor at the block of flats. That's how bad the smell was that emanated from it. Neighbours also reported that they would see Gemma out and they'd see her picking up cigarette butts off the floor and then she'd take those cigarette butts off the floor and then she'd put them into roll-ups so she could smoke them. And again, other concerns that were being reported was that she's still being exploited. So people were giving note that possessions had been taken from her and you know she might have lent them to people but she wasn't expecting to get them back. Also, they started to suspect that people were taking money off her from a regular basis. So, okay, one could say she was giving money to people, but what those who were around her said was no. She was seen as an easy target and people would just regularly come and get cash off her. Seems like one individual named Colin, he took her Xbox and actually sold it. And then he was even taking £50 a week off her at one point, which is a huge amount of money when you think about Gemma, her living conditions, and the fact that she wasn't working. So she was relying on the benefits that she was given. And this man is coming in, selling her possessions for himself, and then taking £50 a week off her. She also told the agencies that one of the reasons that she was giving him that money is because she just didn't know how to say no to him. Again, straight away, you're like... How is that not ringing major alarm bells that this vulnerable young woman can't say no to predators? Instantly, we should be aware that she is not in a position to take care of herself. Then in May 2010, she allegedly gets assaulted by a man named Tom. She's at a friend's house. So again, men are abusing her. And Neighbours are actually really concerned about her welfare because they're seeing that there are lots of liaisons with men. So, of course, if you are a predatory male and you know that there is a young, vulnerable, naive girl who doesn't know how to say no, you're going to queue up. And it's horrific to imagine that Gemma was vulnerable that way. She is a complete victim in this circumstance. As far as I'm concerned, she was not in a position where she could have even consented on a legal basis. But these guys are obviously coming around for one thing. On her actual internet profile, she described herself as big, bold, and beautiful. So men would apparently drive to her flat from all over, and then she would leave with them in their cars. And one of her neighbors, who was obviously a compassionate and caring person said, it absolutely worried him sick. And let me tell you how he described her. And I think you all connect with this already, but just let's give you insight from somebody who lived very close to her, observed her actions, grew very concerned. He said, she was a big woman, but in her mind, she was like a four-year-old child. A four-year-old child. This is just an observation from a neighbor. They didn't need an assessment. They didn't need social services to tell them what was going on with you. They could tell simply by the actions of Gemma. 
And another thing that was noted is that Gemma found it really difficult to understand emotional cues. So when people were bullying her or making fun of her, she just didn't connect. She didn't get it. She didn't realize. And apparently some of her so-called friends, and they are not friends at all, but so-called friends, they were noted as apparent friends, but we all know they're not. They tattooed Simon STD on her wrist. She actually went around telling people that was her boyfriend's name and she had absolutely no understanding what STD meant. I'm assuming, of course, that everyone knows that that means sexually transmitted disease, but in the UK, STD and STI are used interchangeably, meaning that somebody has basically picked up a sexually transmitted infection. Now, on top of this, all of these things happening, She's again facing eviction from her tenancy because she can't cope with paying her bills. At this point, you would imagine that somebody from social services is getting involved, but no. She still somehow remains ineligible for adult social care. And the interaction with the support services around her just remained really sporadic. So things have fallen apart. And they're not just falling apart. Now, they've been falling apart since she's left college and no one is picking up the pieces for her. So we know it's clear that Gemma wasn't engaging with some of the available services that could have potentially helped her. And because of that, it seems that this is the excuse why she wasn't taken into adult social care. So this, this resistance that she had, combined with the fact that she had not been at this point identified now as having learning disability or autism by the mental health team. This was enough to stop her from being given the additional support that clearly we all know she required. It seems like there's a real vicious circle right now, isn't it? Because the reason that she wasn't engaging was due to her learning disability and medical conditions. Yet her medical conditions were not being diagnosed. Without a diagnosis, she remained ineligible for adult social care. And without this support, she continued not to engage. And this failure to engage was then another reason that she was not referred to the adult social care team. It's just bizarre that I can list why the failures are occurring. It's that Gemma hasn't got the capacity. She's being treated in a way which assumes that she has the capacity to engage and to know what to do to create circumstances that mean that she should be able to take care of herself as opposed to her vulnerabilities that are being exploited, being noted, and it being re-referred to social care to acknowledge that in spite of the fact there isn't these diagnoses or agreed physical understanding of what's going on for her, the behavior of Gemma is clear and the decline in Gemma is clear, but no. Now it would later be established that between July 2001 and February 2008, Gemma had 11 separate assessments open for adult social care, 11. So there's obviously a lot of people saying, you know what, Gemma Hayter needs more care than she's being given. But ultimately, in spite of all of those 11 assessments that had been opened for adult social care, all of them were ultimately closed. So feels like there was just this massive lack of communication and lack of joint working between child and adult services. And this is something that I've experienced a great deal in my career when I've worked with children in care who then leave care at 16 years of age and just like fall through an enormous hole. There's meant to be extra help or they leave at 18, maybe they've had additional help. And then again, they just fall through this great big hole because there isn't the services there to pick them up in the way that they need. Now, Gemma was really vulnerable. She's at constant risk of exploitation. She had the constant threat of homelessness just hanging over her head. Furthermore, we know that she didn't have the social skills of people her age. She had a very lacked sense of structure. So she didn't have structure in her life. She wasn't in education. She wasn't in employment. She was dealing with all of these problematic vulnerabilities without any of the proper support that her physical and mental health clearly warranted, clearly warranted. Now, Gemma did actually 
write to social services herself and she pled for help. She said, I would like a job. I need my independence. I would like someone to help me when I ask for it. This is what I need and want in my life. So you can see that even when she's saying I want independence, she's saying, I don't know how to get it. I need somebody to help me. Thus denying the reality of her capacity to be fully independent. Now, it's against this entirely dysfunctional backdrop, this chaotic backdrop that I've just discussed with you, that tragedy struck. This is in August 2010. Gemma was 27 years of age, just 27. Now, as I told you earlier on, Gemma was literally desperate to be accepted. She craved friendship. But sadly, the people that she chose to associate with, all they saw in Gemma was a victim to be exploited. Now, like Gemma, they all led some chaotic, unstructured lives. Also, it's worth noting they were highly immature for their age. And like Gemma, these friends, in inverted commas, were all unemployed. Furthermore, like Gemma, they were also often the victim of crime. However, unlike Gemma, they were also the perpetrators of petty crimes and violence. So whilst they were victims, they were also perpetrators. And what's really sad is what Gemma wanted was for them to be her friend. But actually, they weren't really interested. All they wanted to do was to use and to abuse her. And they definitely did not have her best interests at heart at any point. And tragically, because of Gemma's chaotic life, it meant that she inevitably crossed paths with these individuals. Now, it would later be stated that she was victim of a mate crime, i.e. she was taken advantage of by the young individuals that she associated and spent time with. And it's worth noting that she definitely indulged in the same unhealthy behaviours as the people that she hung around with. But of course she did, because if you want to fit in with your peers, you're going to do what they do. You know, if you want to gain acceptance and you have something lacking in your world and these people present you with an opportunity to fit in, then you're going to do things that ingratiate yourself to them. We've all done it. We've all done it. I've done it. I don't know anybody who hasn't done it. You're like, I would never do that. And then you meet a guy that you really like who suggests that you should definitely do that. And you're like, I will definitely do that. I'm not saying you're all like that. Just saying I might have been. Not always with guys either. If it was a girl I liked and respected, we should do this. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Even though 20 minutes earlier, I'm like, I would never do anything like that. And I have a really strong mind, but we all want to impress somebody, don't we? Don't deny it, any of you. But this bid to gain acceptance, again, plays into those vulnerabilities. And she actually starts reporting to service providers that she's now drinking and smoking weed. Again, I mean, how innocent. The fact that she's telling people in positions of power that she's actually taking drugs and drinking alcohol and she's not thinking about potential consequences. Again, that should have been a massive red flag for the services. Hang on, somebody with deep vulnerabilities is drinking and smoking and hanging out with people who are petty criminals. But no, straight over their heads, obviously. Now, one of the individuals that Gemma associated with was 21-year-old Chantelle Booth. Chantelle was a teenage mum. She had two children, two different dads, not judging. Lots of people have different kids to different dads. Just saying, this is showing you that even as a teenager, there was a level of dysfunction in the fact that she had had two failed relationships to the point where she'd been able to have children. And it also gives us insight potentially into some of her vulnerabilities as well. Certainly, Chantelle Booth, would not be having an easy time of it. Now, Gemma had known Chantelle for around 18 months. And as far as Gemma was concerned, they were friends. I can tell you now, if ever there was one of the biggest misinterpretations and mistakes that Gemma Hater could have ever made, it's that Chantelle Booth was her friend. Chantelle Booth was never her friend. I'm not gonna die, Chantelle. Just like Gemma had had a chaotic life, she was emotionally immature. She was also known around the area for getting into violent altercations with people. She had been in trouble with the police, 
she'd had a GBH conviction, she'd been sentenced to a community order and her children had actually been placed in care. So again, we can see that there is a level of dysfunction in her ability to be a parent in the fact that she had had them removed. Also in May 2010, she was convicted of common assault. So she's handy with a fist, shall we say. So Chantal Booth lives with her boyfriend, 19 year old Daniel Newstead, and they'd been in a relationship for around two years. According to Gemma's neighbors, what Chantelle and Daniel would do is they get Gemma to shoplift for them, which oh, is so frustrating. They can spot this vulnerability and they prey on it. Now, Daniel, just to tell you about Daniel's background, well, he was known to both the Warwickshire Youth Justice Service and Warwickshire Probation Trust. Wow, he had a history of antisocial behaviour. He'd been convicted of several offences. This was between 2004 and 2008. This included things like an offence of a fray. He'd basically been in possession of a metal bar and a knife. Also, he had a history of violence towards women. And I'm not just talking about, you know, girlfriends. No, Daniel didn't just like to be violent towards females he was in relationships with. No, 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 no. If I'm going to be violent to women, why should I discriminate just by taking it out on my own partner? I shall be non-discriminatory. Instead, I shall be violent to my mother, my sister as well. Basically, anyone who's female and breathing and within his parent circle of trust. Stroke circle of malice in this case. It seems like, as far as Daniel is concerned, violence is just a completely normal part of life. He didn't see it as unusual. He didn't see it as unacceptable. And the situation that led to violence at times was exacerbated because he had constant substance abuse issues, which led to anger management issues, had this massive chaotic lifestyle. He's emotionally highly immature. So because of this, he was actually involved with mental health services. However, despite the fact that he's involved in these services, the assessment hadn't actually identified any mental illness. There again, psychopathy isn't a mental illness, is it? So who knows? Maybe they couldn't classify him with a mental illness. Certainly doesn't mean that there wasn't something dark, malevolent and terrifying going on beneath the surface, just saying. So Chantel and Daniel lived in privately rented accommodation just about a couple of miles away from Gemma's flat. And they hung out with another couple and that other couple were actually neighbors of theirs. And that was 17 year old Joe Boyer and 18 year old Jessica Linus. Now, Joe and Jessica had only just started a relationship. They were just at the beginning of it. And they had met in supported accommodation in May, 2010, which again, gives you some insight into the kind of relationship that was probably going on because there's a lot of chaos when it comes down to supported accommodation prior to arriving there. Usually there's been a lot of disruption and dysfunction in people's lives and dating people in similar situations kind of one level make you feel like people understand you, but can also additionalize some of the burdens that you're carrying anyway. So Jessica had actually moved into his private tenancy two months after they met. So he'd moved on, got a private tenancy, and then within weeks of them getting together and then him moving out and moving there, she moved in, which again, not ideal. They don't really know each other, they're very young, they've got a hell of a lot of chaos going on in their lives. Now, like her friends, Jessica was also known to the police and she had been both the subject and perpetrator of various assaults and she'd received a caution. And like Chantal, she was also a teenage mother with a child in care. So I guess that they related to one another that way. But again, we're seeing high level of dysfunction, failure in capacity to care for their own kids and some emotional dysfunction and dysregulation there on the fact that they were dealing with some challenges in being separated from their kids, I would imagine, too. Now, there were allegations that Chantel and Jessica had previously bullied and assaulted a young woman who had been living in supported accommodation. That was in June 2010. 
And it seems that this was a trait within Chantel and Jessica. So they would notice somebody vulnerable, they would connect over that, and then they would enjoy bullying that person. And it feels like they displayed exactly the same behavior towards Gemma. And now let's just take a second as well, because I've not mentioned Jessica's boyfriend, Joe. His background, well, he also had a criminal history. In August 2009, he was given a four month referral order for possession of cannabis and he had received a further referral order in June 2010 for the same offence, so he hadn't essentially changed his behaviour. I know that lots of us will think possession of cannabis shouldn't be a big deal, but it was as far as it did cause him a consequence and it didn't change his behaviour. So consequential thinking clearly isn't something that really is paramount in his mind. and. He was somebody, in spite of these offences, who, when I look back at his past, didn't have a history of violence at this point. So he hadn't been highlighted as being abusive to women, there wasn't like a long criminal record of violence, but in spite of this, believe me guys, this is all about to change for this individual, simple as that. So both of these couple actually hang around with a fifth individual. This is 19 year old, Duncan Edwards. Now, Duncan Edwards lived nearby with his mother in rugby, and he was known to youth offending services. That was in Enfield, and that's where he used to live. And he had been convicted of nine offences and investigated for a further nine. So clearly, very much on the radar of the services and authorities. Now, despite the fact that Chantal was in a relationship with Daniel, it's also worth noting that she and Duncan had apparently been sending each other flirty, shall we say, texts. Flirty. I use the word flirty. I mean, some could say dirty, but we'll stick with flirty. Some flirty texts. Now, that would obviously be a contentious issue, shall we say, in the relationship. Certainly, I imagine if our partners were flirting with somebody on their mobile phones, there would be some repercussions, shall we note. But nonetheless, just adds to the chaos, adds to the dysfunction, and also there's some deceptive behaviour in there as well. So they're not actually demonstrating pro-social qualities right now, even between that friendship group themselves. The only member of the group who actually knew Gemma was really Chantelle. She was the only one who you could say knew Gemma relatively well. But Gemma still considered every single member of that group as her friends. She was desperate to connect, desperate to fit in. Sadly, of course, that group of friends didn't feel the same about her at all. To them, her life literally meant nothing. It's disposable. Disposable. Simple as. She wasn't even human to them. I'll discuss that a little bit more as we go through it, but she wasn't. She wasn't human. As far as they were concerned, Gemma was a whole different type of being to who they were, and that makes it really dangerous. If somebody can categorise you in a different paradigm to how they categorise themselves, it lends to behaviours being different for you than it would be for them. They would afford you less positive behaviours than they would afford themselves. And that's even on the very beginning of the spectrum. You know, as we go further and further into the darkness, it can mean some very tragic consequences for people put in categories that are less than the same as other human beings would regard themselves. That's the way that this case goes, without a doubt. Now, witnesses would actually testify down the line that they would see Chantelle mistreating Gemma. She'd call her names. She'd suggest that she had Down syndrome, which I guess to Chantelle would be some kind of horrible insult. To people with mature minds, that's not an insult. People do have Down syndromes and they live very wonderful, loved, full, pro-social lives that give back to our society. But clearly for somebody as, shall we say, intellectually challenged as Chantelle, when it comes down to the reality of her slurs not really being slurs, she thinks that she's being cruel. Also, and this just blows my mind, on one occasion, Chantelle Booth shaved off. 
gem as her. That is high level assault, that's high level bullying, isn't it? To dehumanize, and what is that telling us about the incremental abuse impact within this relationship? It's incremental, isn't it? It's name calling. Now it's shaving off her hair, it's testing behavior. What can I get away with? And the feedback that she's getting is clearly something positive. She's obviously enjoying the power, enjoying the control. Remember, she comes from a chaotic background. She's probably suffering domestic abuse by her partner. She's able to take some of her lack of control and exert it over Gemma. And she's doing that. Sadly, in spite of this clear bullying, Gemma still hangs out with the group. She's prepared, sadly, to take that abuse if it means that she can just call them her friends, which is beyond heartbreaking. So what we're talking about here, we're talking about Gemma Hater, desperate to connect, fit in, belong, and she'll take the pain, she'll take the abuse just to be around people that she believes are her friends. And she hasn't got the sophistication to understand that that is not what friendship is about. Now on Saturday, the 7th of August, 2010, Chantelle goes to a meeting, this is with Gemma, and it's at Rugby Borough Council, and they're there to discuss her potential eviction from the council property. Now, according to the council workers, they said there was genuinely nothing in that meeting that caused them any concern. But why would that? Chantelle isn't going to start being abusive in front of the council workers, is she? That's not how it would go. She'll know how to behave. So it doesn't surprise me that there is no concern raised there. Later that day, Gemma, Chantel, Daniel, Joe, Jessica and Duncan, they're seen drinking in Rugby Town Centre. And it seems that at some point, Gemma manages to get on the wrong side of the rest of the group. The reason for this is she basically tells the doorman and the staff at the bar that Chantel's only 15 years of age. Clearly they're in a pub, that's going to very much annoy Chantelle. We have to remember, as I've said, Gemma had problems with social behavior. This is probably either just a joke to her or she's just making conversation, she's just having a giggle. She could have, in this moment, never have foreseen the consequences. However, because of this fake information that she disclosed about Chantelle, this was then shared via the pub watch scheme. So the consequence of that was that the group was basically refused entry to several pubs. I know guys, I didn't even know that there was a pub watch scheme. <laughs> like, we've got a 15 year old who looks like this, send it out to all the pubs. Who knew, who knew, but this must be a thing to prevent underage drinking. But obviously it causes them some issues and they get thrown out of several pubs. The rest of the group are incensed by this. They're angry. They blame Gemma for spoiling their night. And this is when Chantelle gets physical. So Chantelle, who's really angry, and remember she kind of categorizes Gemma differently than she would herself and her other friends. She pushes her down the road and she actually punches Gemma in the face. Jessica then slaps her. So now we're in a situation where Gemma's getting physically abused. You'd imagine, ideally, that if you were in a situation where somebody got physical with you that way, well, I mean, if it was me, I'd be like, you've just assaulted me. I am calling the police. Both of you are going to have convictions against you. That is what I would do. That is what you would do, right? Or, I don't know, somebody punch you in the face, you might lay them out flat. I know that for some people, they don't do the old, I'm gonna to report to the services, they just knock them down, and that teaches them a lesson too. I'm not advocating violence, I'm just saying fight, flight or freeze, or action such as dealing with the police. They are your choices, and some people, if you punch them, you're gonna get it back twice as hard. But nonetheless, Gemma does none of these things. She's so desperate for friendship. She doesn't create any distance between them. She's used to taking abuse, isn't she? It's part of her every single day experience. When you think about personal safety, you think about yourself. And of course, for the most part, we think about protecting our own and ourselves. So our family, 
and who you are as a human being. But Gemma's used to being exploited. She doesn't have that personal safety at the forefront of her mind. All she wants is to be included. It doesn't matter that she's in pain. It doesn't matter that she's being laughed at. It doesn't matter that she's being abused and aggressed. What matters is she's got people around her. That is more important than her personal safety. So even though this has happened that night, it doesn't trigger a warning sign in Gemma. It doesn't make her create distance between this God-forsaken, violent group. Sunday the 8th of August, 2010, Chantelle and Daniel invited Joe and Jessica around. It's to their flat about 4 to 5 p.m. for Sunday lunch. I say Sunday lunch, I'm imagining it was a bag of chips or something they could throw in the microwave. Maybe it was a bag of Doritos. Sorry, I know I'm sounding negative towards them, but I can't imagine it was round for roast beef, Yorkshire puddings and all the trimmings. They don't strike me as individuals who would be doing that. That's all I'm saying. Maybe a can of beer and a spliff. Anyway, that's the plan. So Joe's friend Duncan, the fifth person in this group, joins them throughout the afternoon. And it won't surprise you to know that through the evening, they do drink lager and they smoke weed. I suppose that was a starter in the main, if nothing else. Now, I'll be honest, we're never going to know what the group's intentions towards Gemma were at this stage, when they were all there for that Sunday lunch. But we know that Chantelle, at some point, decides to text Gemma and tells her to come round. Now, I cannot help but believe that this group was smoking weed and drinking, and they were talking about what had happened where Gemma was concerned regarding the pubs and their seeding. And they were also all talking about how it's all Gemma's fault and they've already been violent towards her and they're starting to kind of pump each other's thoughts and feelings about the way they perceive this event. This is my assumption of what went on. I believe that there is anger and resentment towards Gemma after the events of the previous day. Gemma, of course, jumps at the invitation. She wants friends. This will have been a wonderful moment for her. Wow, I'm being invited round to my best friend in her head and her friends group, and I'm gonna be able to hang out with them. So she joins them at the flat about a couple of hours later after that text. However, during the course of that evening, the group just turned against Gemma. And this time, the violence that was involved, it would far exceed anything that Gemma had ever been through before. It didn't even come close prior to this experience. You know, she has never been in a situation of mortal danger. The trigger, apparently, for this event was an alleged historic theft by Gemma. Apparently, She'd stolen 800 pounds in backdated child benefits from Chantelle that she had failed to pay back. I mean, that's what Chantelle said. But one of the things that we can already tell about Chantelle is she's hardly somebody that we can believe. Now, whether that was the motivation in that moment, we'll never know. But what we can see is that when you want to do something negative, if you want to harm somebody, you create a reasoning behind it. It's a psychological prop. Well, this person deserves it. Why? Well, because of A, B or C. Even if it's not really true, you need, unless you are a serial psychopathic killer, the truth is you need something to hang the hat as to why your actions played out. So in this case, Chantel's trying to create a reasoning. She wants to be brutal. She wants to make Gemma pay. So she has to create some kind of reasoning behind it. Truth is, we'll never really know the motivation behind the brutal events that I'm gonna talk about. Now, Chantel had apparently got upset at this point because she's obviously making it all about her. Remember, she wants to be violent towards Gemma. She wants Gemma to pay a price. So now she's crying and Daniel's angry and Duncan's angry as well. These guys, remember, are both kind of involved with her. So Duncan then hits Gemma with a pillow. That doesn't sound too bad, does it? But it 
breaks the seal on behavior. The minute that somebody takes to a physical position, whether it's a pillow or anything, the minute you make contact with another human in that way, when there's a malevolence behind it, you are giving others permission to do the same. So when he hits Gemma with that pillow, the physical assault begins. So he starts to hurt her. He's not just hitting her with a pillow. And then the group also start to humiliate Gemma. And it gets really severe. So Joe and Duncan, they urinate in a can of lager and then they force her to drink it. So now they're controlling her actions. They're watching her in pain. They're forcing her to drink urine, humiliating her. And it's then that the violence just begins to spiral out of control. Over a four hour period, Gemma was subjected to sustained and serious physical assaults. This included Gemma being headbutted by one of the group. Allegedly, it was Chantel who did this. And the consequence of that headbutt was that her nose suffered several fractures, so she'd have been in a lot of pain. They also slammed her face into a radiator and they were able later forensically to find blood that was found up the walls and the radiator. Then Gemma was beaten. They beat her with a mop. They put masking tape wrapped around her face. They shaved her hair again. And apparently one of the things that happened was that Daniel was really angered by the fact that Gemma had made such a mess of his flat by getting blood everywhere. So he punched her in the face twice. I mean, literally, what do you want to say and do to Daniel? You know, Daniel's angered. Do you know what? I'm really angry that this girl that we are violently assaulting and abusing and pushing her head and smashing her gaze, radiators and nutting her and breaking her nose. I cannot believe the inconsiderate victim who has just bled all over my room. She needs to be further punished. How can anybody buy into a biased mindset like that? How can you believe your own BS that you would believe that was acceptable? Then they at some point lock her in a small ensuite bathroom. So this is now a place where she is a prisoner. She's completely unable to ask for help. They've taken a battery from a mobile phone. They actually take that battery and they flush it down the toilet. So she has had the most horrific sustained violence for four hours. Now just past midnight, this is on the 9th of August, a badly beaten up Gemma asks Joe and Duncan to walk her home. However, at this point, all five indicate that they'd walk her back. Again, just think about that. How trusting is Gemma? Even though she's been treated diabolically, even though she's clearly in pain, even though she would be scared and confused, she's asking them to get her home. She's trusting them still. She believes, in spite of what she's experienced, that they couldn't possibly want anything malicious for her. So in spite of all five indicating they're gonna walk her home, she just accepts that, despite the serious, prolonged assault that she's been subjected to. It's really sad that she evidently just took them at the word. And a judge later stated that she tagged along battered, in pain, and unsuspecting, like a faithful, loving dog. In spite of the fact that she asked them to walk her home, in spite of the fact that she laid her trust down and allowed them to take her where they took her, at no point was she ever going home. They were never intending to. Instead, they walked her to her death. Now, due to the serious injuries that Gemma had already sustained, they actually had to clean her up first. They didn't want to get any attention towards her. Now, that shows intent, doesn't it? There's premeditation there. They know if they take her out, covered in blood, looking visibly injured, 
that somebody is potentially going to act. You know, she had bled profusely from her badly broken nose. So they have the wherewithal to try to disguise these injuries. They have the wherewithal to know that they could get themselves into trouble if they're seen walking through the streets with a badly injured girl. But also, it says that they have an intention to do something further, doesn't it? They don't want anybody to interrupt this attack because it isn't over yet. So they clean her up for that reason. And that, to me, shows the highest level of antisocial behaviour that you can imagine. The premeditation is there. CCTV actually captures the group leaving Chantelle and Daniel's flat. And it's really sad watching that footage because you can see that Gemma is following at the back of the group. The cap's pulled down over her head and her broken nose is actually still bleeding. And instead of the group heading towards Gemma's flat, they instead walk her half an hour in the opposite direction. These guys have made a decision before they've left that flat, haven't they? Why would they take her in a different direction? She's completely vulnerable. She's completely unsuspecting. At this point, instead of her returning safely home so that she can nurse her bruises, because not even that would have been enough to separate her from their friendship group. She would have returned. She liked them, in spite of the agony and duress that she was under. But they're never gonna give her a chance to do that. They take her onto this disused railway line. It's a place known as the old station. It's remote, it's unpleasant. It's a place that no one would go for innocent purposes. And here, they just continue. Gemma's further degraded, they strip her completely naked. At this point, Duncan actually attempts to set her clothes on fire. He actually singed his hair in the process. It's a shame that he didn't set himself on fire fully. Sorry, I know that that would have been somebody who got horribly injured or worse. I don't care. You play with fire, you get burned. And in this case, you abuse a poor defenseless woman and then try burning her clothes to disguise what you're doing. Well, essentially, if you go up in flames, I don't care. I don't care. But that didn't happen, sadly. Sadly, Duncan didn't go up in flames. So instead, the group then subject Gemma to this further set of physical assaults. They place a big black bin bag on her head. She screams, she's terrified and she manages to remove it for a moment, but they forcibly put it back on her again. They viciously beat her. They kick her, they stamp on her. And her head was stamped on so forcibly that it actually left the outline of the footprint on it. They stab her in the upper back, near her shoulder blade, tragically as well. The combination of the assaults, the difficulty breathing due to the bag on her head and the complications from her broken nose, all of those caused Gemma to choke to death on her own blood. That's how Gemma died. She choked to death on her own blood, terrified in the dark bag over her head, totally defenceless, finally choking that way. It's unimaginable what that poor girl went through in those last moments. The group just disregard Gemma like a piece of rubbish. They leave her face down on the grass verge. And at this point, they're captured on CCTV. They're walking back to the flats. It's between 1.09 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. Following day, Obviously, we've got Duncan, he's got singed hair, right? So he's got to go and get his hair cut. Just gets on with it. No problem. Water off a duck's back. The group then go out drinking in Coventry. They're not concerned at all. It's around 5.30 a.m. on Monday the 9th of August 2010 when a jogger finds Gemma's badly beaten body. When they do the autopsy, it's heinous what they discover. They identify more than 50 injuries to her head, face, body, and 17 of these were to her face, head and neck. 
they concluded that she had died from the blockage of her airways by blood as a result of severe facial trauma. Gemma's broken nose was so severe, the bone was almost completely severed. And let me tell you guys, I have had a severe break to my nose. I've also had a collapsed bridge due to endoscopic sinus surgery. I have been in situations where my nose has been completely, completely distorted. And it's very painful. The idea of your bone being almost severed, I cannot compute the agony that girl would have been in. You won't be surprised to know it didn't take long for all of Gemma's attackers to be arrested the next day. Obviously, we know there's CCTV footage. They would have been the last to be seen with her. But also, Daniel actually told a receptionist at the local social services that he had been present at the killing. Which is an interesting move, isn't it? That he's actually telling this receptionist that he was present. That noted, it wouldn't take a rocket scientist to put this picture of possibility of these being the potential suspects together anyway. There's loads of footage with them on it, so they are essentially banged to rights. All of them at this point are charged with Gemma's murder. And you can imagine, can't you? These are good mates. So when they're interviewed separately, they all absolutely stand by one another and say that it didn't happen, they weren't involved, none of them could possibly have gone out of their way to do something so heinous. Of course they don't, never ever happens, never has happened, never will happen. They all just start grassing on each other. So they're just blaming each other for Gemma's assault and death. They all try to minimize their own part in it. During the actual interview, Joe referred, by the way, to Gemma as that thing. I told you, didn't I? I said that one of the things that you have to do often, if you are going to carry out some kind of brutal attack or murder, is you have to dehumanise the individual. Because if you remain seeing them as a human, then you can feel emotions that are not conducive to allowing you to go ahead and do the terrible things you want to do. By calling her the thing, that thing, seeing her as different, that gives you an entry point to be able to act in a way that you would not ordinarily act. Ultimately as well, they all plead not guilty to charges against them, which is bizarre. But also means, as we know, that if they all go not guilty, there's gotta be a trial. And that means putting Gemma's family and friends and people who knew her through it. It's as simple as that. It's reprehensible behavior because we all know that these five are guilty as hell. So the trial begins at Warwick Crown Court. It began in June, 2011. I can't use the words I wish to describe the defendants with because they would be beeped out. But let's say when it came to brain cells, when you added all of the brain cells of the defendants together, there were five and three of them were fighting one another. That's how bright they were. Now in trying to blame each other, one of the things that happened was they just kept changing the version of events. Also, personal highlight for me, during cross-examination, which is where the prosecution get to examine the defendant. Chantel swears at the barrister. I mean, just go ahead, Chantel. That's what we wanna see. A nice pro-social young woman who couldn't possibly be an individual who behaves with malice. I mean, one would imagine in a court of law, if you cannot control your abusive behavior, you're not giving us a good insight into how you are on the streets, just throwing it out there. For anybody who's ever got to be in a situation where they're defending their character, swearing at the barrister for the prosecution is a bit of a big no-no. Judge doesn't like it, jury can't stand it and the barrister that you do it to as far as the prosecution is concerned will be grinning from ear to ear because you've just expressed what a negative kind of human being that you are. Now the way that the group decide to kind of turn on one another is that ultimately Chantel, Daniel, Jessica and Joe all claim that Duncan was the only one responsible. 
Can you imagine being Duncan? Hang on a minute. You were all involved in this same crime. And Chantal, you've assaulted Gemma before because of the pub incident. And now I'm to blame. And all of the others are like, yeah, none of us want to go down for it. Because that's what great friends are like, isn't it? Run for the hills and save your own skin. Of course, Duncan's not having any of that. So he blames Daniel. Joe goes for the, I know nothing. I know nothing. I was far too intoxicated to remember anything. Yeah, just go for that one, Joe. That's always one that works. Even though you're on CCTV walking down the street with Gemma, I know I'm there, but I just don't have any recollection of it. So you're saying that you were there, but you don't recall that you were there. Yes, I don't recall that I was there, but I was there because I've seen it, but I don't remember because I was too intoxicated. So you agree that you were present when Gemma was placed in this situation and then died. Yes, and you're saying that you didn't have anything to do with it. I had absolutely nothing to do with her death. May I draw your attention to the fact that you've just said that you were too intoxicated to remember anything? I did say that. Meaning that you could have been involved in killing her and just not remember. You're good. Should have probably thought that one out a bit better. I imagine that the prosecution went something like that, if nothing else. But that's the way that he says he has no recollection of this. Also worth noting, bear in mind, when you're in a court of law, there are some clear rules that you stick by. And I have been in situations where I have been in court watching young men that I've worked with being interrogated by the prosecution. And we've always taught them the same. They dress smart, they act respectfully, they refer to the barrister with sir. You do everything that you can to show that you are your best self in that moment. You don't want the judge who's gonna pass judgment at some point to think that you are less than pro-social. You want that judge to make them think that at least at the very worst, it was just a mistake that happened and this is not the real you because they are going to make a decision over your future within the realms of the sentence that they can give. They don't care. This five, in spite of the fact they're all turning on each other, they seem to be viewing the trial as a joke. They're all having a good laugh. They're passing each other notes. It's like, genuinely, it's almost as if they didn't seem to care that they were facing murder charges. At the moment when the trial is going on, they're showing no remorse. And at one point, and this is what I'm saying, you do not want a judge to get to this point. The judge separated them like naughty school kids. That would not be appropriate action and behavior in a court. And again, you are letting the judge and jury see you for who you truly are. That's not how you want to appear. Now that trial lasts seven weeks. July 2011, when it ends. There's two days of deliberation. There's a jury of seven men and five women. They found all five defendants guilty of assault, occasioning actual bodily harm. So all five of them were found guilty of that. But Chantel Booth and Daniel Newstead and Joe Boyder, they were all found guilty of murder. And all of them were sentenced to a life in prison. And Chantel, well, she was given a minimum of 21 years. So Chantel was seen as the main aggressor. She got a year more than Daniel, who got 20 years. And Joe, Mr. I don't know. I don't think I remember any of this. Uh, is that going to work in my favour? No, Joe, you got 16 years, didn't you? 16. Meanwhile, I've got to say that Jessica Linus and Duncan Edwards were actually found guilty not of murder. They were found guilty of manslaughter. So Jessica received a sentence of 13 years. That is still a heavy sentence for manslaughter. And Duncan got 15 years for manslaughter. Bear in mind that Joe got 16 for murder. So you can see what I'm saying. When it's a case like this, the judge and the jury are watching and that misbehavior, when it came to the judge sentencing, I guarantee he was looking at the parameters for those who got not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter, the biggest sentence possible. Interestingly as well, it was only when they were found guilty that suddenly reality started to sink in. 
Now, Daniel, Joe and Duncan, they apparently just sat emotionless in the dock. But Chantelle and Jessica, they screamed, they cried, they swore and they hugged one another. So they were suddenly shocked into reality. Lady Justice Rafferty actually sentenced them. This was at the Old Bailey. And she used disability hate crime legislation to go ahead and to hand out longer than expected sentences. Like I said, you don't cross a judge. You don't do it in front of a jury. You don't act disrespectful in the court because it indicates the kind of people you are out there and they were already being seen as individuals who had taken somebody entirely vulnerable and tortured and murdered her. So that judge is absolutely going to do her best to throw the book at them. She referred to the torture of Gemma and the murder of Gemma as vile and a chronicle of heartlessness. And in reference to making Gemma drink urine, the judge stated this, I struggle to see how much lower you could have sunk. So you can see, can't you, the formation of the identity that that judge has with the defendants. She can see absolutely no redeeming qualities and she is not afraid to express that. Following the trial, Gemma's family issued a statement they said, our Gemma was a very loving and vulnerable woman who trusted everyone and her trusting nature and vulnerability led to her death. Gemma's sister, Nikki, later described her sister's tragic death as this. All of her blood was up the radiator and up the wall. The whole thing is just so sad. Her life was just so shit all along. So for her to die in such a... It's just everything about it is horrible. She's right, isn't she? That's such a good description, just that the hopelessness and helplessness felt by the family though, wow, she had all this to contend with, all these challenges to face, and yet still, in spite of getting the support and the care and the consideration and the help, she ends up dying, tortured and murdered on a train track. Her mother, Sue, is still convinced that Gemma, in spite of what she went through, would have forgiven her attackers had she survived. And she expressed her feelings about them. She said, to have your child murdered by one person is horrific. Five people? Five people who did not try and stop it happening. Five and not one of them reported it? I still do not understand how Young people such as this could do such a thing and they have shown no remorse whatsoever. I do not hate the five. I'm not sure what I feel towards them. Pity, I think, is the first thing that comes to mind. Such sad, wasted young lives. I have to say I've got massive respect for Sue. Not sure I'd feel that way. I think they chose to waste their lives. I'm sure they had some difficulties in their lives ending up where they ended up, but this, like she said, there were five of them. Any one of them could have intervened. Any one of them could have said no, enough. Any one of them could have run off and got help. They didn't. They were a pack. They were predators. They hunted as a pack. They preyed as a pack. They destroyed as a pack. And now they face the consequences as a pack. Whether they'll change, that remains to be seen but it says something empathic and compassionate about Sue, that she can feel pity when all I feel is rage. Gemma's life story is an absolute tragic case. At no time during her adult life did one agency have a proper overview about what was happening. They didn't have the full understanding of what was going on, the understanding of the risks that she was being exposed to. Instead, there were multiple agencies involved in her lifetime. They were not sharing the information efficiently and effectively, and that is how things failed. Now, the lack, and there was very little evidence, by the way, of effective multidisciplinary working, that meant that crucial information about Gemma's vulnerability simply wasn't shared. So the different services weren't aware of it. In the last 10 years of Gemma Hater's life, her situation was looked at 168 times. 
by 13 different agencies. I mean, that in itself, the fact that they're looking 168 times at one case by 13 different agencies, there should be alarm bells going off everywhere and somebody should have taken control of it, gathered the information appropriately and accordingly and called it together at a case conference to explore what could happen to help Gemma Hayer and it didn't occur. We just see cases closed again and again and again, resulting in what we're talking about today. You know, Sue, Gemma's mother, she fought throughout her daughter's short life to get her the help that she needed and that she deserved. And she stated this, I tell other parents in my position to just go with your gut instinct. You know your own child. And if you think something's wrong, it's probably wrong. That's why I kept going back to the authorities and humiliating myself, but they wouldn't listen. I was called an attention seeker, but I kept going back because I knew something was wrong. You do that for your children. I needed help. It's just heartbreaking that she even, after Gemma's death, is trying to help other parents fundamentally understand that they need and deserve to demand that help because she is a case in reason and question that we can look at who has determined that the results of the failures in services has left her without her daughter. Gemma's willingness to accept the abuse for the sake of being acknowledged as a friend is just utterly heartbreaking, isn't it? She was the victim of mate's crime, as it's known, which I don't agree with. It's abuse, full stop. But I appreciate they lulled her into a false sense of security and then they exploited her. You know, she perceived those horrific humans as being friends. So she covered up the abuse. She had this desperate need for social contact, for friendship. She wanted to combat that isolation, that loneliness that she felt. And it led her into situations that she could not possibly have understood were going to involve the collateral and fallout and damage that they dealt. She didn't have the social skills to recognize the dangers. And she didn't receive any of the help and support from adult care services that could have protected her. Instead, what we saw was her life became more and more chaotic. It became more and more dysfunctional. She got into further debt. She was at constant risk of losing her home. She became more isolated. So she became more and more dependent on the very people who were going to eventually take advantage of her, who were going to exploit her. And subsequently, she ended up surrounding herself with people whose lives were chaotic, where violence was a normal part of their existence. And this violence was ultimately directed at Gemma, this vulnerable adult, this easy target. They didn't want to be her friend. They just wanted to use an abuser. They basically tortured and killed Gemma for their own entertainment. Simple as. Now, following Gemma's tragic death, you won't be surprised to know a serious case review took place in 2011. And believe me, what did they come up with? Well, they said opportunities to help Gemma had been missed. In fact, they said many opportunities. There were 23 missed opportunities between 2001 and the time of Gemma's death, including nine opportunities missed in the year before she died alone. 23 missed opportunities and nine in the year before she died. Unbelievable, disgraceful, and highly unprofessional. Now the report concluded this, this case sets out evidence of the subculture that continues to prevail within some groups of people where drug and alcohol abuse is endemic. There's a lack of respect for others and where violence and mate crime is normalized. Now, worryingly, according to Home Office statistics, crimes against people with disabilities have risen by 300% since 2011. 300%. The charity MenCap estimates that nine out of 10 people with a learning disability are verbally harassed or exposed to violence because of their disability, 90%. That's what they're saying, that's what MenCap are saying, as a society for me, it is a tragic indictment that we cannot ignore. The very fact 
that agencies like Mencap are coming out and saying 90% of people with issues like Gemma are verbally or physically violated in some way, are exploited. These are our most vulnerable, our most needy, our most in need of care, compassion, consideration and protection. And yet look at those statistics. Gemma Hater did not deserve to die that way. Gemma Hater deserved to be given the support. She deserved to be still cared for and loved by her family. She deserved more. And it wasn't as if her mother wasn't asking for it for many, many years. You look at cases like this and you think, please let it make a difference to the way that we treat the most vulnerable. But I'll be honest with you, certainly for me, the cases I've been covering recently that also explore people with disabilities literally being tortured or withering away in the terrible substandard care of their caregivers, for example, things aren't changing and they need to change. I hope you found this at least in line with what you've heard before regarding Gemma. Obviously, I hope that you feel that there's an added value to what I've discussed today. Please let me know if you found out anything more about this case through what I've said. Obviously, my heart, my thoughts, my feelings go out to Gemma's family. I feel like I know this case even more than I did when I covered it on television. And I do feel even more incensed at the lack of cohesion that the services failed to have, which could have prevented this heinous crime playing out. Give me a like, give me a comment, share your thoughts and feelings, subscribe if you haven't subscribed, and remember that I will be back same time next time for True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. And remember, I'm on tour at the moment, so if you fancy coming and seeing me anywhere in the UK, there are loads of new dates. I'll make sure the link is below. Be safe, look after yourself.